what we have thus far, speaking now in the year 2016, so roughly the last 20 years or a bit more, is we've seen a rapidly growing number of very rigorous, first-rate scientific studies done of meditation. Uh, it began with TM, I believe, and then, then of course, the whole mindfulness movement has become very prominent. There have been uh, scientific studies of compassion, of empathy, and so it's broadening out a bit. But overwhelmingly, the nature of this research thus far is that the professionally trained sci scientists who have designed the experimental design, the research, who collect the data, analyze the data, publish the data, and quite rightly, get the credit for the publications and for their findings. They're the professionals, and they are studying the meditators as subjects in the study. So in instead of studying pigeons or rats or hamsters, they're studying meditators. And so often, and actually in most cases, the meditators have no voice. The papers are written by scientists, and we never who learn who the meditators are, or if the meditators are following a certain instructor, we often never learn who that is. So they're being studied as, as objects, and the, the studies tend to be thoroughly objective, studying the behavior, the physiology, the health effects, perhaps the cognitive effects, which are studied by means of objective measures, standard science again. So this has been good. This has been a good first step. Uh, and it is demonstrated, I think, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that various types of meditation, actually they've not, they've not explored much of a, of a variety yet, but it's starting. Uh, but it's been clearly demonstrated that basic methods for training the attention of mindfulness and so forth can be helpful in a myriad of ways uh, for health benefits, cognitive benefits, reducing stress, of course, uh, developing pro-social skills, it may be help in productivity in the marketplace and so forth. But there has been, from my perspective anyway, a total lack of parity here. And that is the meditators, in the vast majority of cases, are not professionally trained. They're meditating a half an hour a day, 20 minutes a day. Maybe they've even done a three-month retreat. Whereas the scientists have years and years and years of professional training. And then years and years of professional research under their belt. So they're professionals and then they're the meditators. Well, this is a good start. It's certainly better than nothing. Uh, but over the last 45 years that I've been dedicated to contemplative practice, I've gotten to know quite a number of extraordinary contemplatives uh, who are utterly professional. And I, of course, know many scientists and philosophers who are utterly professional. Uh, but when I've engaged with people who have spent 10, 20, 30, 40 years in full-time contemplative practice, I know perfectly well I'm dealing with professionals. These people are not just cultivating niceness, just for warmness, warmth and kindness and empathy. Uh, they certainly are doing that. But through contemplative inquiry, discoveries are made. They're using rigorous methods of investigating the nature of the mind and addressing these issues I, I referred to earlier. They're making their own discoveries. And so the next step, and I think the last 20 years has been a good primer for the next step, and the next step is the big show where the juice is, and that is bringing together highly trained, professionally trained contemplatives with highly trained professional scientists, each with their own skill set, each with an enormous amount of experience, insight, and wisdom behind them, and for the first time in human history, get them together. We've had outstanding science since the time of Galileo. There's been outstanding contemplative inquiry for millennia, for millennia. But then we can ask, well, but how does that happen? These are two very dis disparate. Two, it's actually more than that. Mo number one, we have multiple disciplines of, of science. Even within psychology, we have clinical psychology, cognitive psychology, affective psychology, developmental psychology. And then in neuroscience, of course, then we have the cognitive neuroscience. Uh, we have behavioral psychology as well. And then there are those who are interested in applications, as in the fields of education and so forth. So there's certainly a, an array of disciplines that are very relevant to this on the scientific side. But then we go to the contemplative side, and then we find, of course, there are Hindu and Buddhist, Christian and Taoist, Sufi and Jewish, Jewish contemplatives. 
Uh, and all of these traditions have been around for a very long time, and each of them has a range of contemplative methods of inquiry that are designed to yield insight, knowledge, to make discoveries. So if we simply have these two communities, each one very diverse, and say, well, let's just put them in the same room and see what happens. Well, I think a lot of confusion would happen. They don't share a common vocabulary, except for just the vernacular, uh, but they don't share a common, a, a common vo uh, vocabulary, professional vocabulary, which scientists do from discipline to discipline, contemplatives do. If I focus on the contemplative tradition, with, of course, with which I'm most familiar, then I know, being fluent in Tibetan, having studied some Sanskrit, there is a very sophisticated, rigorous, precise uh, language that is used for theoretical and empirical investigation of the mind, the relationship with the body, the role of mind in nature. It's a very sophisticated vocabulary using many terms for which we have no counterparts in English or I don't think in any European language. So there's clearly a lot of groundwork to be done just in, find, in terms of how can we communicate with each other so that we don't confuse, that we actually have clear channels of communication going. But a final point, I know I'm giving a very long answer here, is that, well, what constitutes a professional contemplative? Is it merely that one has put in a lot of years? Well, no, one might have, you know, tinker, or, tinker in science, have, in, in one's garage, have some science, science kits, maybe a little telescope and so forth, and do that for many, many years, and be a, a tinkerer. That doesn't make you a scientist, that just means you've done it for a long time. And the mere fact that one has meditated for a long time doesn't make one a contemplative or a professional contemplative. And then within contemplative practices, there are those who focus entirely on uh, ritual practices. And so for practices that really make sense are, how do we say, meaningful within their own tradition, but may be very difficult to translate outside, right? And so I look within the contemplative traditions and I say, all right, well, are there any common denominators that all the great contemplative traditions have? And the answer is yes, there are. And that is all of these, to varying extents and in various ways, have, de have developed uh, attention skills, metacognitive skills, have developed methods for observing carefully subjective experience. We find this everywhere. Some more, some less, but it is a common denominator. And it's certainly, I'll say this now as a, a matter of principle, if one is interested in contemplative inquiry as a means to exploring the nature of the mind and these related issues, then you must train your attention. Because we know in our modern world, uh, just it's an agitated world. It's hard to stay focused on anything. The scientists have the advantage that they can simply focus their telescope and it stays on the, on the target, or a microscope or an x-ray. They can bring stability to their observations, rigor, continuity to the observations because they have technology to observe the phenomena out there. But if you're trying to observe the mind, well, you, none of those instruments of technology can observe any subjective mental event at all, only the behavioral expressions and the neural correlates. So if one wants to make rigorous, replicable, sophisticated, precise, valid observations of the mind, you have to use your own awareness, your own mind, your own attention to do so which means that's the first thing that has to be trained. You have to learn how to be able to sustain your focus uh, on mental events uh, without stressing out, without agitation, without falling into dullness. So we need these three qualities to be able to sustain the focus on mental events, states of consciousness, in a relaxed way, a continuous way, and with clarity. So to my mind, this training of attention together with metacognition, the ability to observe one's own mental processes. This is an indispensable element of any contemplative tradition that entails contemplative inquiry. That has to be a common denominator. I would say the analogy here is if you're an astronomer, there's a wide variety of astronomy, many ways of exploring celestial events. But the telescope is a common denominator. If you have no telescope, you're not an astronomer. You're not doing research. You have no telescope at all. So the telescope for the mind is very refined concentration, focus attention. <coughs> and we have a term for this. We may as well use, because it's now in the vernacular in English, samadhi. Samadhi, I would say, is the telescope of the mind. 
And that is an indispensable element uh, to enter into the league of contemplatives. To be regarded as a professional, you cannot be a professional contemplative and have an agitated ADHD kind of mind.